This is Danny Bobro, president of AIM Dental Marketing, welcoming you to this installment of the Practice Perfection Web-Based Education Series. Today's presentation is titled, Wellness Coaching for Dental Caries, Up Your Prevention and Treatment Game. Caries risk management is now considered best practice in the prevention and treatment of dental caries disease, although early attempts in clinical practice were overly complicated. Successfully implementing this concept into daily practice involves all management systems. Of equal importance is the need to acquire new skills to help coach the patient along their journey to optimal health. This approach has been variously called motivational interviewing, patient-centered dentistry, and wellness coaching. Regardless of the name, this lecture will present the philosophy and verbal coaching skills to allow you to seamlessly integrate it into your practice. You will learn to identify the common known risk factors and treatment strategies for dental caries, elucidate the biofilm model of dental caries, learn to discuss with the clinical team the strategic decisions necessary to successfully implement caries risk assessment into daily practice, utilize new verbal coaching skills to help your patients achieve optimal oral health, and learn to communicate the virtues of fluoride and nano-HA remineralization. Dr. Kim Cooch completed his DMD at the University of Oregon School of Dentistry in 1979. A founding expert in dental caries assessment and treatment, he teaches dental teams how to view and successfully manage caries as a whole person disease using a caries risk management approach. He has authored over 100 articles and acts as scientific advisor for dental caries at the prestigious Coy Center. He reviews for multiple journals, including JADA and Compendium. Dr. Cooch practiced clinical dentistry for 42 years in Albany, Oregon, and currently acts as CEO of Dental Alliance Holdings, and we could not be more excited to have him joining us today. You are invited and encouraged, as always, to submit your questions at any time using the question button on the provided menu. If you cannot get to your question during the webcast, Kim has promised to do so shortly following his presentation. Attendance at today's event entitles you to apply to receive one and one half hours of PACE approved continuing education credit. Shortly following Kim's presentation, you will receive information on how to apply to receive your CE. To be eligible, you will need to successfully complete a brief quiz, as well as note the following course number, which is KUT052523. Again, that's KUT052523. If you're driving or for some other reason we're not able to jot that down, rest assured we will be providing you with a link to a recording of this webcast. And now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the Practice Perfection stage my friend and colleague, Dr. Kim Cooch. Hello, hey, Kim. Danny. Hey, Danny. Good afternoon. How are, how are you doing? I'm doing great and excited to have you on board with us. All right. Well, I'm excited too. So welcome, everybody. I've got a lot of material to go through tonight, so I'm going to like jump right in. Um, you know, the, the title tonight is Dental Caries, you know, Go Upstream. Um, I plan on talking about dental caries, bringing you up to date on what we know about this disease, caries risk management, looking at risk factors so that you can identify those in your practice. And then I want to condense at the, at the last 15, 20 minutes, I want to condense a two-year wellness coaching program into 15 minutes for you to help you gain the verbal skills so that you can implement this in your practice and be successful doing it with your patients. So the title is, is Go Upstream. We're going to talk, get into that in a second. Uh, Danny pretty well covered you know, my personal disclosure here. I'm CEO of, or of Dental Alliance Holdings. We manufacture the carry-free system. We'll be talking a little bit about that more at the end as well. Uh, I also just started a podcast a couple of months ago. I'm pretty excited about it. It's called Contrary to Ordinary. Uh, it's on every platform. It is topping some of the charts. We have picked up tens of thousands of subscribers and I'm interviewing extraordinary people, but not talking about dentistry per se, but talking about their backstory, their life story, um, and really get into the human interest part of it and what makes them extraordinary and, and what drives them. So that's pretty exciting. I certainly invite you to, to listen to those. 
Um, so the title tonight is Go Upstream, and, it's, and this is from a book uh, that was written. And there was this urban legend. Uh, these two guys were in a stream and they were fishing and all of a sudden a child comes bobbing down the stream that's drowning and they pull this kid out of the stream and before they even turn around there's another one bobbing down and they rescue that child and pretty soon the children are coming so fast that they can't even keep up with it and finally one guy jumps out of the stream and he's, and he's starting to leave and his buddy is like where are you going and he goes I'm going upstream he goes, we got to get up here and stop it upstream. And in a, in a nutshell, the analogy is appropriate for dental caries because we were trained to drill and fill. And that's treating the end stages of this disease. And if all you do to treat dental caries is drill and fill, you're going to drill and fill until your patients run out of teeth or die. And it took me 20 years in practice to understand that we were missing something there was we needed to go upstream and start treating this as a disease so that's really what I want to take you guys tonight I love to fly fish this is me upstream in one of my favorite rivers in Alaska um, but so this patient came to me she's 40 years old came to me as a new patient uh, her previous dentist had placed six PFM crowns on her maxillary incisors there one year ago and Two of them have already failed, and before I could get her back and even have a consult, another one had fallen out. And so, you know, this is what drill and, drill and fill dentistry is not the treatment for dental caries. Drill and fill dentistry is for the restoration of the damages of the disease, but it doesn't treat the disease. And we were trained, I was trained, that's how you treat dental caries and, and, it's, and it's wrong. That's the piece that's missing. So instead of looking at the cavities, we need to go upstream and we need to look at this as a disease. I don't care how many cavities this patient has, I wanna know why they have cavities. If I can figure out what's causing their disease, then I have an opportunity and the patient has an opportunity to get healthy and stop having cavities for the rest of their life. And if all we're gonna do is drill and fill the end stages, like I said, you're gonna just do that until they run out of teeth or die. Um, and instead of looking at teeth then, we need to go upstream and look at the person as a whole. Like I want, this is a whole person disease. And I think that's the biggest challenge for us all as dental practitioners, as dental professionals, we put on loops and we're focused, you know, four and a half power, we're focused on an individual tooth surface, you know, in a patient's mouth. And we, we kind of forget that that tooth is attached to a patient and there's a whole range of issues some behavioral, some lifestyle that play and genetic that play a role into why that tooth has a cavity. And we need to back up and look at that. And the minute that you can kind of understand or see this as a person level disease, it's when you'll have a change in your mindset and you'll be able to take this to the next level in your practice. And that, that happened for me about 23 years ago. I was in Australia, I was with he and no, I was uh, lecturing down there and he and it kept asking me, how do you diagnose dental caries? And after he asked me four or five times, and I'm like, well, I don't know. I actually didn't know. How do you diagnose this disease? I know how to identify cavities, but I didn't know how to uh, diagnose dental caries as a disease. I came home from that trip. I contacted John Featherstone at UCSF and Doug Young, and I fortunately became one of the first members of the first Caries Risk Management Committee, the Canberra Committee, and started to learn how do we look at this as a disease. Dental caries, out of the 302 diseases that the World Health Organization tracks, dental caries is number one. And dental caries in primary teeth is number 10 on the list out of 302. This is a ubiquitous disease. It's been with mankind from the beginning of, of our time. And, it, and it, all of our attempts with drill and fill dentistry have not changed that at all. So it's still number one. Dental caries, you know, how do you define it? This is probably the best definition I could give you. And this was really uh, by committee, by uh, a committee from the Caries Research Journal, uh, ORCA. And everybody got their favorite words in, but I think it's pr probably the best definition for dental caries I can come up with. Dental caries is a biofilm mediated, it's caused by a biofilm, 
diet modulated, you know, that lifestyle, and we're going to talk about that, has an impact. It, there's multiple risk factors for this. It's non-communicable in the classic sense. I'm, you know, I'm not going to sneeze, and if you're sitting next to me, you're not going to catch a dental caries. I mean, it doesn't, or you know, if I kiss somebody, you know, we're not transmitting that disease. However, the biofilm itself is transmissible between individuals, and primarily from like mother to child, who has a, or primary caregiver to child, who has a developing biofilm in their mouth. Um, but it ends up as a dynamic disease that results in prolonged periods of low pH that ends up with net mineral loss in the dental hard tissues. And so that's kind of the focus of how you describe this as a disease. This is Phil Marsh. Um, Phil Marsh published the first research that pH was the driving factor of this disease back in 1989. Um, I interviewed Phil uh, for my podcast, an amazing researcher. He was considered a heretic and he was ridiculed in the 80s and 90s when he first published this work. 35 years later, this is considered standard knowledge, not even you know, remotely challenging. And he is one, uh, he's the most award-winning scientist recognized in dentistry in the world, an amazing individual. But he proved back in the late 80s that the biofilm is, the selection pressure in the biofilm for dental caries is by prolonged periods of, of low pH. It selects for those aciduric, microbes that will play a role in this disease. And why is that pH so important? Because in your mouth, the biofilm plus the diet plus the saliva, which is the protective mechanism in the body, should be zero, it should be neutral. It should keep our teeth mineralized. So if we go back to the Stefan curve, this blue line is the critical pH of enamel. It's roughly about 5.5. You wake up in the morning, you're above the line, you have breakfast, you drop below the line, your teeth demineralize. When they demineralize, little spherical particles of nano HA come out of the enamel. This is not an ionic thing. This is a, um, a small pieces, crystallites, many crystallites come out of the teeth and your saliva is super saturated in nanoparticles of, of hydroxyapatite with a, in a spherical in shape and about an average particle size of 20 nanometers. And in a normal mouth in about 20 to 30 minutes, that recovers after you eat and you go back into a, a period of remineralization and those uh, particles of nano HA go back and fix the and repair the enamel. Now you have lunch, the same thing happens, gets back into repair, now you have dinner and the same thing happens. If you had three meals a day in a healthy mouth, Dental caries would not be a threat. John Featherstone's research indicates that just snacking two times a day, now you drop in the curve, you have a snack in mid-morning and you have a snack in the afternoon before dinner, and maybe some people even have a snack after dinner before bed, dropping that pH in the mouth starts to favor those acidogenic, acid uric microbes and starts to shift toward dental caries. Now, the patient that doesn't have enough saliva, they have hyposalivation or xerostomia, you know, they eat and it may take one to two hours for their mouth to recover. So it slows down because they don't have the protective saliva. And in fact, you have some patients that are really severe, you know, their mouth may hardly ever recover. And that's why you see some of the challenges that your patients have. But again, not having enough saliva it takes longer for that mouth to recover. Now you take your patient that has hyposalivation and if they snack, now you've got a recipe for disaster. And that's the first patient that I showed you, somebody that's snacking frequently and doesn't have enough saliva and you're gonna have a nightmare. When we look at the current biofilm model, um, we look at three factors and this should sound a lot like periodontal disease in the biofilm. It's biofilm dysbiosis, which means the biofilm is not behaving um, in a healthy manner. We know there are potential systemic effects from dental caries, and we know that there are hereditary factors. Just like when you think of the biofilm disease, periodontal disease, these same factors hold true for dental caries. So let's look at those real quick. This is Ann Tanner at the Forsyth Institute at Harvard. I was able to do uh, some of my research, my biofilm research through there. I was fortunate enough to do that. Ann Tanner is for my dollars, 
probably the best biofilm expert in dental caries in the United States, uh, maybe in the world at this point in time. The big news in the last eight years in dental caries is candida. We always found candida in the deep dentin lesions, and we are, and it's a very acidic place. And we always assumed, oh, well, candida is very acid uric. It loves living in an acidic environment. So it's just there because the environment is acidic. I would tell you, after dealing and studying biofilms for 20 some years, there are no coincidences in biofilm. If there is a microbe that's there, it's playing a role or it wouldn't be there. It's part of the biofilms and it's not just there by coincidence. There are no coincidences in biofilms. So the big news is candida. Um, dental caries is not a disease of mutant streptococci like I was taught. 40% of all adolescents in the United States that have severe early um, childhood caries don't even have that organism, those organisms in their mouth. So it does play a role, but not for everybody. So as we talk about that, you know, that old model of this is strictly a disease of mutant streptococci, that doesn't, that, that, that model doesn't hold water anymore. So now we start to look at an entire profile of the biofilm. And this is Antana, one of Antana's papers uh, from uh, 2019. Now we start to look at the biofilm itself and say, is it healthy, is it karyogenic, or is it periodontal pathogenic? And it's not a specific pathogen, it's a biofilm. And so that one pathogen, one disease, again, that model doesn't work anymore from what we know about dental caries. Um, so when you talk about that, you look at everybody has potentially a different biofilm in their mouth. Um, everybody has different risk factors. So when you do that, suddenly the treatment for this disease, dental caries, is not gonna be the same for every patient. You know, this is not a one size fits all treatment and it's the treatment is not drill and fill dentistry. So we need to look at those risk factors, help the patient identify those, and then we need to be able to coach them on how do we help mitigate those risk factors so they can get to be healthy. This is Doug Thompson. Uh, Doug teaches at the Coy Center. He has a practice in Michigan. Doug has been collecting longitudinal data on the medical management of uh, patients with periodontal disease for over 20 years. He has more longitudinal data than anybody that I've met worldwide on periodontal disease. So he's kind of my go-to person uh, for, for that disease and that biofilm. He created the wellnessdentistrynetwork.com. And if you don't know him, uh, he was a founding member of AOS and you need to get to know Doug. Um, but when we start to look at the biofilm and how it has a systemic effect in the body, I think you and I are all on the same page. It's not controversial. If I said to you, periodontal disease has systemic effects, we'd all agree, you know, in terms of peripheral uh, inflammatory effect in the, in the in the circulatory system. And here are just a, just a couple of studies on this, but I got to tell you the, the body of evidence looking at strep mutans uh, is growing in terms of what it does when it gets into the bloodstream and the rest of the body. And in this study, 13 patients that were edentulous, the number one organism when it was found in the mouth, it was found 100% of the time in the atherosclerotic plaque was strep mutans. Uh, Prevotel intermedia was 92%, Porphyrmonas gingivalis. Of course, we know the PG is very pathogenic, but it was only present about 15% of the time when it was found in the mouth. But so we know that uh, strep mutans plays a role in peripheral vascular disease. You know, it's not clear exactly what that role is, but again, I'm here to tell you it's it's not a coincidence when you find it in the plaque samples and on the heart valve plaque as well. One thing we know about strep mutans is if it has the CNM gene, if it's a CNM positive version of that organism, they can directly invade endothelial cells. The endothelium is only a couple of cell layers thick. This is really a, a problem. And so we've, it's been identified and there've been a number of studies now uh, it's responsible for microbleeds in the brain. It plays a risk factor for cardioembolic em infarct, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, and aneurysm ruptures. Um, so we know, and it's also the causative agent for most uh, bacterial endocarditis. In this study, uh, it, 86 adults 
what they what they reported was that strep mutans when it's found in the arterial system does the same thing that it does in the mouth you know with that glucosyl transferase it converts and creates these long sticky uh, polysaccharides, the dextrans and the mutans, which form the infrastructure for a biofilm. So they're kind of create a biofilm in that atherosclerotic plaque um, in, in the blood vessels. So strep mutans, you can't have a healthy mouth, you know, an unhealthy mouth and have a healthy body. We know that genetics plays a role in dental caries as well. And this is Alex Vieira. He's at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, started out as a pediatric dentist. Uh, he's from Brazil, had a special interest in genetics, and now, as far as I'm concerned, probably the world's leading expert in genetics and dental caries. has published a lot of papers. This is one of his first studies, and this was published back in 2010. And they looked at 300 people randomly that came through the dental school, and they tested them for beta defensin 1, which is a salivary proteolytic protective enzyme. It's created by the submandibular glands, excreted by Wharton's ducts, so it protects those mandibular anterior teeth. What they found was the people that carried the G20A polymorphism had DMFT and DMF scores that were five times higher than people who had the other uh, polymorphisms. And I have to tell you, if you don't read a lot of science, when you get to an odds ratio of five, I don't see that very often in scientific research. In fact, I, it's rare. When I was doing research at OHSU, if we got to an odds ratio of two, we had literally had champagne in, in the laboratory that afternoon. So it's like an odds ratio of five, it gets your, should get your attention. So we know that this plays a role. We know that taste plays a role. It's another one of the genes um, that play a, a major role in dental caries. Where there's the TAS 2 r 38 gene. These kids we call super tasters. They're extremely sensitive to phenols. Phenols are found in all of our cruciferous vegetables, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, um, asparagus, etc. cetera. Uh, so these children are very susceptible to phenols. And so they are not going to eat those vegetables. Um, interestingly enough, that gene loses its expression somewhere in 30, midlife, 35, somewhere around there. Um, and then the TAS 1R2 gene for sweet. You know, those children prefer sugars. Sugar is the most addictive substance on the planet. We're going to talk about that. But so this, there are children that you know that are that are resistant to eating vegetables, and there are children that favor you know sugar over over vegetables as well. We know that at this point in time, there's you know 38 total genes that play a role in dental caries, um, and we know that it plays a role of about nine percent. So I got to be um, on the first Canberra committee with John Featherstone headed that. Doug Young was there, Mark Wolf from NYU, Margarita Fontana. Uh, there was about 11 of us, Brian Novi, and they were all educators and researchers, and I was the lone clinician. They were trying to figure out how to get this to be standard of care in our education in the dental schools. I was trying to figure out how to create this as standard practice in my dental practice. The problem is we put our heads together, we looked at all these risk factors, and we created this system of carries risk management that was overly complicated and it did not work in private practice. I could not get it to work in my own practice. So if there was a mistake that could be made, I'm pretty sure I made it in the process. But one of the things that I identified by 2013 is that I would regularly see dental carries come into my practice in a series of patterns. I would see these regular patterns show up. So we took the carries risk assessment forms that I have my final version I created, um, and we sent it to six dental practices. We collected 12,000, over 12,000 caries risk assessment forms from patients who had self-reported their risk factors over a period of two years, and we analyzed their data. 63% of the patients self-identified that they had a dry mouth at some point in time of the day or night, or they were taking medications. 55% either identified that they um, were drinking sugar-sweetened beverage or they snacked frequently during the day. About half of the people noticed a plaque biofilm build up on their teeth and about half of them also uh, had a high bio load on the, of the biofilm in the mouth as well. From Alex Vera's research, we know that 
on a population level, genetics plays about a 9% role in dental caries. Now that's looking at a population cohort. And in, for an, any given individual, it could be higher than 9%. But as a population at whole, it's, it plays about a 9% role in dental caries. Genetics plays about a 13% role in periodontal disease. But in dental caries, at the end of the day, this all comes back to Philip Marsh and his research. This is 100% about pH and driving that biofilm toward dysbiosis. This is my mentor and good friend, John Coyce, uh, who says, and we get that risk assessment form, and this is where we play Columbo. You got the dead body. The patient has visible decay. I want to know who did it and what was the murder weapon. We all look at the caries risk assessment form. We all want to go to the very bottom. We want to make the diagnosis. You know, you know, it's uh, they're low risk or moderate risk or high risk. The value of this form is those questions at the top of the form where the patient's self-identifying, self-reporting to you their risk factors because that's where we're going to address treating this disease uh, to help them get healthy. So this is a risk assessment form that I, um, my team and I developed over a period of probably 12 years. This is version number 12. By the way, this form is free to you. You can download this form if you don't have a, a current caries risk management form. Uh, you can download this from the Carry Free website and it's in PDF form and it's free to you. Two significant things about this form. Uh, number one, we simplified it and took it out of the hygiene operatory and the patient self-reports their risk factors. So those two things were significant. Number one, hygienists don't have time to interview people and fill out these forms. You know, we're already asking them more than it's humanly possible in an hour appointment. And that whole infrastructure needs to change, in my opinion. That one hour profi, you know, recut care appointment, I don't care what you call it, needs to change because it's not possible to continue adding tasks and, you know, you have to compromise somewhere. And number two, by having the patient self-report, self-identify their risk factors, uh, it changes the entire equation. I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you walked in, sat on a patient and said, oh, I see you have bleeding gums. And the patient says, no, I don't. And you're done. The conversation is over. You are never going to convince a patient that they have something that they don't perceive. And so this takes it out of me saying, oh, it looks like you have a dry mouth. And the patient saying, no, I don't, I don't have a dry mouth. To the patient reporting those things to me. And now they're kind of expecting that we're going to talk about that. You go to your physician, they want to know why you've come in, you fill out the form and you report it. And at some point in that appointment, I want them to address what I identify, you know, what's going on in, in my body and, and in this situation in your, in your mouth. So this is a simple form. If you have no risk factors and you have no disease indicators, you are low risk for this disease. You don't have dental caries. And all I want, my, my goal then is to try and just keep you healthy, educate you about risk factors and talk about medications and all of those things so that I want to be able to keep you healthy. Um, that is about single digits, somewhere 10% or less in your practice are, have no risk factors. If they have at least one risk factor, but no disease indicators, they're moderate risk for this disease. They're in the early stage of the disease, but they don't, haven't expressed things like cat the end stages yet. They don't have cavities <clears throat> or white spot lesions. If they have at least one disease indicator, which is a visible cavitation, if they have you know, radiographic radiolucencies, if they have new or active white spot lesions or they have a history of cavities in the last three years, you know, they have the disease itself and then you are high risk for that disease. So let's talk about what these patterns look like. So I want you to think about this. 63% of, of the patients, of these 12,000 patients, self-identified that they either were taking a medication daily or that they felt like they had a dry mouth at some time of the day or night. If you walked into your operatory with a new patient, never even looked in their mouth and said, Gee, I, I find that you have a dry mouth. One of the findings I have is that I see you have a dry mouth. You'd be, without ever looking in the patient's mouth, you'd be right two out of three times. So this is a very uh, pervasive thing. What do these patients look like? They have a dry mouth. This patient came to me, she was in her early 40s. She was taking two medications for anxiety and 
she comes in and she opens her mouth and she is frustrated. She's developing two new cavities per year and her, her previous hygienist, previous dentist were frustrated. And I said, well, what did they tell you? They said, I need to brush and floss better. Take a good look at this photo. This woman has the hygiene, the oral hygiene of a hygienist. She flosses twice a day. It's not a function of hygiene. It's a function, look at her mouth. She has no saliva. The saliva should be bubbling between the teeth. It's impossible to get photos like this in a normal person because you can't keep the saliva evacuated along, you know, fast enough to get decent clinical photos. So it's like they have a dry mouth. So when we look at this, this is data from the, the Mayo Clinic. 70% of all Americans take at least one uh, prescription medication. This is from, at, uh, from basically babies from age six months through seniors, adults. 70% take one prescription medication per day. Half of the public takes two or more, and 25% or 20% of your, your patients take five or more every day. And we know that the number one side effect from every prescription medication basically is hyposalivation. So right there, our data at 63% self-identifying reporting that, and 70% of the patients are taking a prescription medication. I feel pretty strong about that data. So this is what they look like. They have a lack of saliva and they're probably taking medications. Uh, the next up is diet. And I want you to take a look at this photo. What does a dietary risk factor look like? This is what sugar looks like in the mouth. When you see cavities spread all over the mouth, this is sugar. This patient has adequate, they have saliva in the back of the mouth, the tissue is wet. This is not a function of not having adequate saliva. This is a function of this patient is eating too frequently and eating too much sugar, right? So they're snacking and they're drinking something other than water more than two times a day. And typically that's a sweetened beverage. Americans, we eat 23 teaspoons of sugar a day. Uh, we are off the charts on that. High fructose corn syrup, we're number one at 51 pounds per person per year. Um, Mexico for perspective is number two at 30 pounds per year. We're off the charts on our diet. But I just want you to, when you see this, I immediately know this patient has a dietary problem. When we talk about uh, biofilm, typically you see plaque buildup on the teeth, or if you're using a, a <clears throat> biometric like the carry screen meter, they would have a high carry screen score, of high back, you know, mic microbial load, biofilm load. We now there's a we now know there's over 60 different microbes that have been identified as playing a role in dental caries. And the big news in the last eight years is candida. So again, you may see a, a plaque buildup on the teeth. Um, when we talk about genetics, this is the only pattern that we can, geographic pattern of dental of cavities in the mouth of this disease that we can identify that, that's traced back to a gene. And this is lysozyme. Uh, it's a Lysel 2 gene. This young person was referred to me by the local pediatric dentist. Um, she had only had ever had cavities in her mandibular incisors. She's had them filled twice and they need to be filled again. And she has a defect of, in the Lysel 2. She has a polymorphism of the Lysel 2 gene, which makes it the lysozyme less effective. These are the most protected teeth in the mouth. These are the last teeth standing. If a patient has six teeth, which ones are they? If they have two teeth, which ones are they? These are bathed 24 seven and two liters of protective saliva. When you tell me that the only decay in this patient's mouth is in those six teeth, when I first read this study back in 2013, I had a hard time believing it. This patient walked into my practice two weeks after I read that that study. And literally, had I not read that study, I wouldn't have had any answer for this patient. But I now know it's a genetic issue. I've seen two more patients like that in my career. So uh, I probably saw more before that. I just didn't know what I was looking at. So we know it plays about a 9% role. There's only one um, geographic pattern we can identify. And I would tell you, I can't, I can't read your DNA yet, but that day is coming. If you're going to be in dental practice, 
uh, 10 years from now, I would anticipate we're going to be doing DNA testing on patients looking for risk factors, not just for oral diseases, but for other systemic diseases as well. But at the end of the day, this is all about the pH. So I, I sit down with the patient, I take the risk assessment form, and I report my findings from the form and from everything that I found in their mouth. One of the things about this is that our approach should be predictive. You know, P4 medicine is about being predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And I want to apply that to dentistry as well. So we know that caries risk management is predictive. Your baseline caries risk is predictive of your future caries risk. Um, we also know this is another Featherstone study that putting a patient through a caries risk management program just putting them through the program reduces their decay rate by about a third over the 18 months. And this was a study that looked at 2,724 adults over an 18 month period of time. So now we come up to part two, your caries diagnosis at the bottom of the form. We know what the risk factors are. We've talked to the patient about that. Um, we've asked them questions. Now we're gonna come up with a diagnosis. It's um, low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. We have guidelines from the ADA for this. Insurance companies are now kind of imposing their own guidelines and they're assigning benefits based on those guidelines and the, and the risk profile that you assign to the patient. But from the ADA, this is uh, almost, you know, what is it, 17 years old now. Um, again, low carries risk, no risk factors, you know, no disease indicators, no lesions in the last three years. A moderate carries risk, at least one risk factor, um, and maybe one lesion or more in the last three years. High carries risk, if you have any of those disease indicators, uh, you have this disease. So again, just going over one more time over the carries risk assessment form, if they only have if the uh, green answer is there's no risk factors or disease indicators, they're low risk. If they have at least one risk factor, they're moderate risk. And if they have at least one um, disease indicator, they're high risk for this disease. I don't know how to make this any simpler than that. So this should function in your practice uh, fairly easily. Again, you can download that form for free from the Carry Free website. Um, next up then is like, well, what do we do? We got, a, we got this patient sitting here, <clears throat> they have this disease, How, what do we do to manage it? And um, I think that's a big question mark for, you know, for a lot of us. In fact, when I started and called John Featherstone in, in 2001, you know, that was my question is, well, how do I treat it? And John's response was, well, Kim, we don't know. And I was like, well, what do you mean we don't know? Uh, this is 2001 and I finally get that this is a disease and now I don't even know how to diagnose it and I don't know how to treat it. So that really motivated me to be involved in that first Canberra uh, committee because I wanted to learn how to do this and I wanted to, my patients to stop getting cavities. Um, so there, we have reparative strategies. We start there. If the lesions are not cavitated, if they are not cavitated, you can remineralize them. Best to remineralize them with nano HA and or in a combination of nano HA and fluoride. Now, if it's an E1 or E2 lesion, which means it's in the enamel only, uh, less than 10% of those are cavitated. If it's a D1 lesion, means it's in the outer third of the dent, and about a third of those are cavitated. The challenge for us as practitioners is which ones are cavitated and which ones aren't, and, that, and that's a challenge. Um, in the middle third and in the inner third, at, when you get to the inner third of the dentin, 85% of those are, are cavitated. So along that spectrum somewhere, you need to make a clinical decision on which of those lesions. And if you can see them, that's great. You can use an orthodontic separator uh, to separate the teeth for a week if you want to you know, have an ideal sense of is it cavitated or not. But remineralization, if the patient will participate. Um, Sealants, we know that sealants work. Um, the atraumatic restorative technique, take a spoon excavator, you know, a, a, maybe a diamond burr, open it up, uh, spoon excavate and place some glass ionomer, uh, maybe treat it with uh, silver diamine fluoride first. And then we have drill and fill dentistry. If it's cavitated, we need to restore it. You can't remineralize a cavitated lesion. 
Fluoride, the best application of fluoride is, is a 5% sodium fluoride varnish. It has substantivity. We thought it was pretty significant. Turns out the substantivity is limited to about 24 hours, but it is good for like 24 hours. It does help. Four times a year. Uh, the, the peak outcome is at four times a year. If you go six or eight times a year, there's no additional benefit. But we know that for those high-risk caries patients, um, that, that they benefit from a fluoride varnish treatment four time, up to four times a year. Um, we also know that our 5,000 part per million fluoride dentifrices are better than the 1100s. They provide a better outcome as well. Um, sealants. Sealants are effective. It doesn't matter if you're using resin or glass ionomer. They fail differently. Glass ionomer uh, sealants fail by bulk fracture. They just come out of the tooth. But interestingly enough, there's rarely decay because underneath that um, sealant, because the enamels had an opportunity to mature, resin sealants fail by leakage. And I know that you've probably all had the experience of having a, a major a tooth damage, you know, from a, a large lesion inside of a tooth from leak from leaking from a sealant. Um, resin sealants can be very successful. In this study, they touched up those sealants every six months. So if you're going to use resin, resin works great, but it's not a one and done. You have to continually manage and update those sealants when you see them in the practice. When we talk about therapeutic strategies, then we've got fluoride, antimicrobial, xylitol, pH, nano HA, silver diamine fluoride, and probiotics and or, and or symbiotics. Um, I'm going to do a, a scientific update for carry free, I think sometime uh, mid to late June, I think it's June 20th. Um, and I'm going to talk about symbiotics. There's some interesting new studies that have been out. Um, we know that fluoridated water still plays a protective role in dental caries. In primary teeth, it prevents about 30% of the cavities. In permanent teeth, it prevents about 12%. It still plays a significant role, and, and I think we should still be promoting fluoridated water. Uh, I, I'm in Oregon, uh, these communities here uh, have slowly been taking fluoride out of the water, which, you know, I'm, you know, that's just another issue. Antimicrobial strategies, I started using chlorhexidine. There's a lot of reasons why not to use chlorhexidine today. Um, one of those is the nitric oxide um, and blood pressure issue from that, from the nitrate, nitrite, nitric oxide pathway in the mouth, from Vianella and bacteroides in the biofilm. But um, so there are studies on that if you want to look that up. I started using sodium hypochlorite back in 2001. Um, this was promoted by Jorgen Slots at USC in the periodontal department as a self-care antimicrobial rinse. It's safe, broad spectrum. It doesn't create any res resistors or adverse effects. We did a study um, in 2008 through 2000, or 2007 through 2010 at two high-risk uh, populations of grade schools in Townsville, Queensland, Australia. Uh, a standard 0.05% fluoride rinse reduced the decay rate in the kids, uh, using it once a day by 29%. Using the sodium hypochlorite treatment rinse by carry free reduced the caries index by 73%, which I can't cite another data, um, any data from any other study that was even close to that. The, the next highest one is 40%. So I feel strongly about using that as an antimicrobial if the patient has a biofilm issue. If the patient doesn't have a biofilm issue, you're not gonna get any benefit out of using an antimicrobial agent. Um, and one thing just from my own data from the, some of the studies I did through Forsyth, uh, sodium hypochlorite does not interrupt the nitrate nitrite uh, nitric oxide pathway. So if you hear that all antimicrobial rinses are bad, uh, Whoever is telling you that doesn't have all the data, doesn't have all the facts. What do we know about xylitol? Um, we know that even small amounts of xylitol um, are synergistic with even low levels of fluoride. So I would recommend any product that has fluoride that you have xylitol with it. Um, and we know that it has a, an absolute anti-cariogenic effect. And I've been claiming this for years, and now we have studies to support that. Um, but xylitol, xylitol gum, uh, we've, we've looked at those studies from the Scandinavian countries for years. That slows down that transmission of the biofilm from mother to, or primary caregiver to child. We know in this study on strep mutans that 
when the concentration of the xylitol got to 0.4 grams per milliliter, it dramatically reduced almost to zero when you got to 0.8 grams, per it was zero. The metabolic activity of strep mutans at that rate was zero. So for the people that have strep mutans in their mouth and is playing a role in their, their disease, having xylitol in a high concentrated form um, at 0.4 grams per milliliter will have an outcome, will have an effect. We talked about pH a little bit earlier with the Stefan curve, took you back to some of your dental school education on that. Um, but we know that pH plays an important role. And when I first developed products uh, for carry free out of my need uh, for having an alkaline product, I wanted to see how it would impact the biofilm and, and how, what kind of outcome we'd have for patients. Um, almost all, most of, oral healthcare products were acidic, and that was about shelf life stability. Now, I, there's a number of them that are alkaline, but we started this conversation, Doug Young and I did, we were kind of ridiculed when we started that as well, but now it's, uh, people have paid attention over the last 20 years. Using an elevated pH is appropriate for people that have a dry mouth or have this disease. So we want to look at products, if you're going to recommend for products for patients, particularly if they have hypos elevation, and make sure you're recommending products that are up in the alkaline range for them. In this study, that uh, this came out of North Carolina, this uh, Terry Donahue's group there, uh, of the products recommended for dry mouth. There were only two at the time that were alkaline. One was rain from x -Clear, and the other was the CT2X spray, or now it's just called spray uh, from Carry Free at, at nine. Uh, we just, this is hot off the press. I got this on the 22nd of May. We did an independent study uh, through an independent laboratory in the UK. I wanted to know how the Carry Free gel at a pH of nine would hold up and influence the buffering capacity in the mouth and the biofilm and it was pre-treated for two minutes the biofilm like you would brushing your teeth with this carry free gel uh, and then it was given 20 minutes of sucrose challenge in the biofilm the ph only dropped from 7.73 down to 7.22 and in the uh, control group without it it dropped the ph dropped to 5.22 which is below the demineralization. So we know that that does have an effect and it does work. What do we know about Nano HA? There's a lot of Nano HA products that are coming out on the market right now. There's some cheap Nano HA uh, material coming from China. Um, we know that Nano HA, let your, your saliva is super saturated with Nano HA. That's how the body addresses this as a protective factor for your teeth. If we didn't have saliva that was super saturated in the mineral the teeth are made of, we wouldn't have teeth. It's as simple as that. So remineralization with Nano HA is as good, if not superior. Almost all the studies show it's as good, and most of the studies show that it's superior to fluoride. The concentration doesn't matter. As long as you're at least a 2% of Nano HA in the product, uh, up through 10%, the outcome is all the same. So more isn't necessarily better. Size, however, matters. The best remineralization in the studies comes in at 20 nanometers, which, oh, by the way, uh, not surprisingly, is biomimetic for what's actually in your saliva. Uh, there is a lot of nano HA that's out right now that has, it's 200 nanometers. Uh, it, that will work, but the best results come with spherical shape at 200, and shape matters. Do uh, you want a spherical or block shape versus a needle shape? A lot of these 200 nanometer, nanometer particles of nano HA uh, are needle shaped. And that, because they're needle shaped, they're, they're sharp, they embed in soft tissue. For that reason, Europe has banned all nano HA in, uh, and because of the needle shaped nano HA that's now present, um, they banned it all. Um, in Europe. So uh, that's a concern. It's important for you to know if you're using a product that has Nano HA, what's the concentration, what's the size, and what's the shape. So I just want to share that with you in a quick note. Most of the studies indicated certainly superior to conventional fluoride. This is a study I did with John Coyce at the Coyce Center, a, a double blind or an independent blinded randomized study. Um, and we found deposition of new enamel within 24 hours in, uh, on these uh, test samples. Um, so silver, I'm sure most of you are using um, silver diamine fluoride. If not, you should be. 
Uh, it's safe, it's effective, it's efficient, and it, you know, it's a carries control agent. I don't like the term arrest because it doesn't arrest this disease. It, it may arrest an enamel lesion, but most of the time we're treating this, we got you know open cavitations and dentin lesions. I just want to share with you, I've had a number of patients where I segmented their care, I treat them with SDF twice, uh, then I, I was treating them every six months, and I did quadrant dentistry on them. By the time I got to the fourth quadrant, two of the teeth, when I <clears throat> went to prepare them, uh, the decay underneath the hard black surface, rock hard, what I thought was arrested and remineralized, that lesion continued all the way to the pulp tissue and I ended up extracting teeth. And that's happened to me a couple of times. <clears throat> and when you go back and look at the research, they're most effective on enamel lesions. You know, it's not that effective on deep dentin lesions. So if you're gonna use it this way, uh, today what I would do is do an ART, take your spoon excavator, remove the soft dentin, uh, treat it with SDF, cover it with a glass ionomer, and then get back to, to restore the tooth later on. So I don't use the term arrest with SDF, but it is a, a very good um, medicament for you to use in helping manage the dental caries and segmenting care. Um, probiotics, you know, people ask me a lot, you know, should I be recommending a probiotic to patients? And the answer is no, with the exception of probiotic milk. And we know that probiotic milk works. Um, and in this study, uh, previous studies indicated it cuts the decay rate by about half if the children drink the probiotic milk every day. Um, in this study, they only did it like two to three times a week. And not only did it slow down their decay rate, cut it in about half, but it even started to reverse some of the early lesions. So probiotic milk, the answer is yes. The rest of the probiotics that have been tested um, have not worked. In fact, using you know acidogenic acid uric bacteria, bifidobacteria, uh, lactobacillus, these are acid loving organisms. What in most of the studies what they did is they joined the party. I mean they're they're those kind of organisms. So it's like rather than you know slow down the amount of of, of straight on oh, my watch is finding this on the web. Great, thank you. Um, and so I would say yes to that. Symbiotics, there's been a number of studies out. They're all in vitro studies and no clinical trials to date. They look interesting, uh, primarily the combinations of um, arginine and, and, and uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus GG along with fluoride. And so I'd say, you know, that's something to just keep your keep your antenna out. I think that may develop into a product at some point in time. We talk about behavioral strategy and lifestyle. We have modifiable, theoretically, which is the diet and their home care, and then you've got non-modifiable. If they're taking prescription drugs, I can't take people off their medication, or if they have special needs, it may be a challenge for us. Interestingly, we don't have a lot of data that supports that actually brushing your teeth reduces decay rates. And some of those studies were, classic studies were done in, in the 1970s. This is one of the studies, however, this came out of Scotland. They had a cohort of almost 100,000 kids. When they taught the kids to brush their teeth in preschool, at age 12, it reduced their decay rate by a third, just by teaching them how to brush their teeth. So, you know, it's, it's pretty intuitive. Um, but again, we do have some research to support it. The diet itself, we talked about sugar. This comes from the WHO. Uh, they recommend that our caloric intake from sugar should not exceed 10% of our total calories for the day. And then they further clarify that and say, well, and if we're really being serious, it shouldn't exceed 5%. And then they say, well, if we're really, really being serious, they re-clarify it shouldn't exceed 3%. So Americans are eating 23 teaspoons of sugar per day. 3% would be somewhere around about a half of a teaspoon. So we're way off the chart here on sugar. I don't have an answer to, to cure that, but uh, you know, in the US, but it's a problem. What's saliva's role? You gotta have adequate saliva to keep the teeth mineralized and healthy. Um, in this study, of uh, 293 senior adults are over the age of 60. 19% um, of them self-reported xerostomia. I prefer the term hyposalivation, and I think it's more realistic that uh, in, in the data that, that I have collected, um, that it's somewhere around 63%. Well, patients have, you know, a dry mouth. 
uh, special needs. I've treated a lot of uh, special needs, particularly Down syndrome in my practice over the years. And the studies indicate that special needs Down syndrome patients have hyposalivation, they have dry mouths. That's not been my experience. In fact, most of these special needs kids have an abundance of saliva uh, unless they're taking medications. And if they're taking medications, that, that changes the equation. But if they're not taking a lot of medications, they have a lot of saliva. And thankfully, they do because it helps reduce their risk for dental caries. So um, that's, that's one of those challenges. We're now down to the wellness coaching part. So I went through all of that in my, edu my own journey, my own education, carries risk management, how do we assess it, what are the risk factors, what do we do, how do we treat the patients, you know, what, what, what kind of things do we use to treat them. And then I got down to the behavioral component and I didn't know what to do. Like I could talk to a patient about how many cavities they had and tell them what, you know, what, how are we gonna plan to restore them and give them all of the advantages and benefits and give them all their options. But when it came down to talking about their lifestyle, which is primarily we're talking diet and home care, um, I wasn't prepared, I, I wasn't trained to do that. And so I think that was, for me was a missing piece, trying to be able to help coach patients. And so I went through a two year wellness coaching program which gave me the verbal skills to sit down with the patient and be very comfortable and very confident on being able to help them. Now, not every person that you talk to or you share this with is going to, you know, take it upon themselves to participate, but the ones that are interested will. And my, my mentor in the world of coaching, you know, has a saying, which I like, it's like, um, I think about all the times I've, showed patients and hygienists showed patients how to brush their teeth and you know, I got the big giant teeth and the big toothbrush and you show them how to brush and you tell them they need to brush and that doesn't change their behavior and you're beating your head against the wall until that patient emotionally understands and connects to why they want to do that and so um, for Ocean Night my coach said you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink <clears throat> however you can feed them salty peanuts. And so I really like that analogy because one of the things that I did in my practice was I continually fed my patients salty peanuts. I continually talked to them about risk factors. I continually talked to them about, educated them. And so over time, you know, when we look at the motivational interview, you know, that whole system, over time, patients getting more and more information may come to a point where they're ready to do something about it or they yeah. understand. Yes. Got a quick question for you concerning the carrier's risk assessment. Yeah, uh, I, I'm imagining that you have a schedule that you that this isn't just a a one and done uh, evaluation because ah. there there are trends that that are right. identified too, and that can and that could be a form of salty peanut too, can it not? Yep, yep, absolutely, Danny. You bring up a really good point. And when I go through at the very end, I'm, I'll go through my protocols for low, moderate, and high risk patients. That's an always. Every patient gets a carries risk assessment form at least once a year in my practice. And for the high risk patients, they're going to get it every three months. You know, I want to mm -hmm. continue to understand what their risk factors are because risk factors change over time. Patients change their diet. Patients change their home care. Patients change their medications. They may start new medications and go off of others. So, Danny, you bring up a really good point that that's not a one and done. It's an annual event. It's an always. Uh, in my practice. So Great. Thank thanks for, for clarifying. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, sure. So wellness coaching helps patients understand where they're at and empowers them to do something about it. So when we talk about wellness coaching, here's the, in my mind, the four most critical features for you. We have to be non-judgmental, and you and I are judging people all the time. And we'll talk about that a little more. We, we need to ask open-ended questions. An open-ended question is something that cannot be answered yes or no. So we'll talk about some open-ended questions. I'll give you some of those to, to put in your toolbox. Um, and we want to report findings. Findings are objective and they're third party. So it's like, this is what I found or what I found was. 
rather than saying you have and you need. We need to get that out of our, our, our language. And then the work is on the patient. This is, not my, this is not my problem. This is the patient's problem. And so I wanna be their advocate. I wanna be their cheerleader, but they have to do the work. So like, this is the participatory part of this. You know, I don't get paid to, to remind them every day to floss and brush or whatever, or, you know, if they're going to try and change their diet, get off the sugar sweetened beverages, whatever it happens to be, I don't get paid for that. You know, that is their work. So Tim, I, you to, may be getting to this too, and I'm sorry to interrupt again, yeah, no, but no, go ahead. Uh, well, and you're going to, maybe you're going to elaborate on it now because uh, being non-judgmental is not, is, is often easier said than done. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I suspect that you advocate practice role play because our our communication can be nonverbal too and a simple yeah, raise absolutely. of an eyebrow or a or a or a it's or it's a, even a if, it, you know it's even it's even if your inside voice is saying to you that's never going to happen this patient is never going to be able to do this this is not going to work that's right that's we have helpful. to be truly internally non-judgmental because what we feel we will we will manifest that's right absolutely and so we we are judgmental we're judging people all the time i'm not judging any of you right at the moment because i can't see you right but if you were you're judging me based on what i'm sharing with you and we judge every person i mean that's just is who we are as human beings we judge everybody no matter how hard we try it's a survival instinct it's a so survival we make instinct. quick decisions you know? yeah. is this a person i need to fear is this a person i can be friendly with is this a person i should say hi to you know we're, we're always judging you know our brain is taking in all this data all the time the important part for us if we're going to be successful helping a patient is i have to believe that this patient is going to accomplish this I have to be their advocate. I have to believe, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna be there for them, you know, and and I'm gonna commit that to them, and I believe that they're gonna be successful. So what we have to be is we need to take that judgmental part and even that inside voice. Um, we need to get rid of it with 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 those patients because otherwise, like I say, 80% of communication is nonverbal. It could just be your body language. I mean, etc. So Danny, you bring up a really good point there. But we are judgmental. I mean, that's who we are. So it's that's a skill that you you have to work on and practice, and and maybe do some role playing, you know, with your with your team. Open ended questions. We want to ask open ended questions, questions that cannot be answered yes or no. And so I, these this is like really important, and I'm going to give you some. This is this boils down to this. That's interesting. Tell me more about that. So that's non-judgmental. Tell me what an average day would look like for you when it comes to your diet. Tell me what kind of things you do. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. And when you when you ask a patient, tell me about that, or if that's interesting, tell me more about that. Um, the patient's going to tell you more about that. You know, a lot of times you you have to work to kind of get them to to be quiet. So. Um, and do you agree, Kim, that sometimes a nice way to generate momentum is to begin with closed-ended questions, questions that can be easily asked and answered? It also puts you in the position of being the one who's asking the questions. Um, that's what I find when we coach our team members on telephone skills, connecting uh -huh. to schedule appointments. That, right. And this is for people with whom you don't yet have a relationship, so it's a yeah, little exactly. bit different. Yeah. But uh, obviously, when you already have a report, relationship it's it's much more appropriate and easier to just dive right into these open-ended yeah. questions and and um and reporting the findings like i've looked at the risk assessment form so i know what their risk factors are now i want to understand them like they've got a dietary issue i want to know exactly what that dietary issue is so tell me about your diet that's interesting tell me more about that and they'll say oh well i i uh i drink uh, mountain dew Oh, 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 that's interesting. Tell me about that. You know, how many, you know, how many times, you know, tell me, tell me what an average day looks like for you. Um, and so that's, this is probably, a, if you write this down, this is the most important phrase that I'm going to share with you tonight is that's interesting. Tell me more about that because it's non-judgmental and it's open-ended and it'll get patients to tell you what their problem is. <clears throat> Findings are the nuts and bolts of this deal. Findings are third party objective. So it's you and I can sit on the, Danny, you and I can sit on the same side of the table. Like I don't sit across from my patients 
when I'm doing a consult. I'm sitting next to them and we're going to look at the findings because that's not me saying you have this, uh, you need this. It's not this me pointing the finger at you. It's me rather than saying uh, you've got a broken tooth and you need a crown. I'm saying what I found was a broken cusp on your lower first molar. That's just a finding. It's not judgmental. It's not accusatory. I, it's just an objective finding. What I found was, what I found was a broken cusp. And then you don't have to say you need a crown. You stop there. This is what I found. And so that's objective, and it's third party. And you can sit side by side, and you're on the same team now. Rather than me sitting across from you telling what you have and what you need, I'm sitting. I'm your coach. I'm with you. We're in this together, and I'm, we're sitting side by side. And we're going to look at the findings. And then the next step that we talk about is it's all in the patient. You know, this the patient does all the work in coaching. Like I'm not doing, I'm not doing any of this work for you. I can guide you, I can coach you, I can co-consult and give you ideas if you can't come up with any of your own. I'll ask your permission, you know, or the patient sometime will ask me, like, I don't I don't know what to do. What what should I do? And it's like, well, let me share with you. Is that okay? Let me share with you some strategies that other patients that were just like you that work for them would that be okay and so you know then i asked the patient what well, this is another coaching thing. what would you like to focus on like what do you want rather than me telling you what you have and what i think you need what do you want to focus on what's important to you what would you like to do and then i asked the question how would you solve this like, okay, so you're drinking uh, eight Mountain Dews. One of the things we found, you're drinking eight Mountain Dews a day, and that's creating a risk for you that's probably tipped the scales and what's driving your disease. How would you so how would you go about solving that? And, you know, most patients will come up with some idea, or they might ask you, well, if I switch to diet Mountain Dew, you know what, I I'll take that. <laughs> you know, it's not ideal, but you know what, I'll take that. I'll take any step I can get. You know, human beings suck at, we suck at behavioral change. One of the challenges we had early on in Canberra was we had a, a form letter with 19 bullet points of what the patient needed to do in terms of behavioral change. We know from coaching that we're only gonna be moderately successful if we attempt to try one thing. And so I let the patient solve. How, you know, what would you pick? How would you solve this? And then very specifically, tell me what your plan is. I want to know how you're going to do that. Like, I want specifics because if, you know, the patient says, well, I'm going to try and drink less Mountain Dew. Okay, well, they may or may not be successful with that. But the patient says to me, I'm going to drive right to the grocery store from here. I'm going to go buy some Mountain Dew or I'm going to buy some water. Or I'm going to buy an unsweetened beverage and I'm going to take it home and I'm going to dump out all the Mountain Dew I've got. And I'm spe that's specific. And that person has an opportunity to be successful. And one of the things that I, you know, pick up your cell phone. This is one of the most important tools that we've got because patients show them, show them how to use this to set a daily reminder. If they need to start brushing or if they need to start flossing, um, you know, set the set set it for seven o'clock in the morning, whatever time they're doing their bathroom morning routine. Put in a reminder so their phone goes off and it says, don't forget to floss or whatever every day to develop a new sustainable habit. It's not a 21 or it's not a 28 day deal. It takes nine months with daily reinforcement. So use your phone. Gosh, use the cell phones. It's a great tool for that. I mean, I use it. My schedule's in there. I use it to remind myself of things all the time. So it's an awesome tool, you know, to set their daily reminder for them. Closing thoughts on this on dental caries risk management. The regular patterns you're going to see come into your practice are 63% of your patients are going to have a dry mouth. More than half have got a dietary issue. Half of them have a biofilm issue, either home care or you know they've got a, over a, too much biofilm load. Genetics is going to play a small role. But at the end of the day, this is all about 100% is about the pH that's going on in their mouth. So the suspects, the risk factors, drive your treatment strategies. If they don't have enough saliva, we want to educate the patient on how to stay hydrated. 
uh, how to neutralize and support the pH in the mouth because they don't have that protective saliva raising the pH and protecting the teeth. How do we stimulate their saliva flow? You know, using a xylitol chewing gum or xylitol mints or, or things like that. Um, having them stay hydrated with water, but make sure um, when they do that, tap water is the best thing they could do. It has a pH around seven. Uh, more than half of the bottled waters that people drink are acidic with a pH of about 4.0, and that's a shelf life stability issue. You take the fluoride out of the water, you know, and the chlorine, how do you keep it shelf life stable? You acidify it. Um, so make sure that if they're going to drink bottled water, that they drink one that's, they can look it up, you can look, you can Google search it, drink one that's at least neutral or better. If they have a dietary issue you've identified, you know, we need to address is it the fact they're drinking, you know, sugar sweetened beverages or that they're snacking too frequently. And, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, we had three distinct meals and maybe you got a snack during the day. You know, now we're grazers, you know, people eat all day long. We eat small meals, we eat on the go. You might be eating right now, driving your car home after work. I don't know, but we continually eat and that changes that Stefan curve we sh that we shared earlier. So it's important for our patients to understand that curve and every time you eat, it drops the pH in your mouth. The biofilm, if they have a biofilm issue, we'll use an antimicrobial agent and or it's also behavior. We need to talk about brushing and flossing. You know, plaque removal, rather than brushing and flossing, I like to talk about daily plaque removal or plaque control. Uh, and genetic, I can't change their genes, but what I do wanna do is educate them on the fact that they're maybe at risk from a genetic condition and just minimize your acid exposures, be as healthy as you can, support wellness. So my protocols, and you, Danny, we talked about this just a minute ago, this is my protocol for a low risk patient. If they fill out a carries risk assessment form once a year, they do that in the reception area, not in the hygiene operatory. I offer them a 12 month fluoride varnish. Remember, these are healthy people. They don't necessarily need the fluoride varnish, but I offer it. I offer them products that have, you know, a, an alkaline pH, xylitol, nano HA, and fluoride. And then I educate them about risk factors. If you should change your diet, if you should start taking medication, I need to know that because it may affect, it may tip the scales. And by the time I see you next time, I mean, the worst case scenario I had was a patient uh, came in a year later. She'd been healthy. I'd restored her. She was a dairy farmer, a, a wonderful person, um, came in with 22 new lesions a year later. And she had a, developed a severe allergy. They put her on these medications, uh, antihistamines and prescription strength, and she treated her dry mouth, self-treated it with lemon drops. And I saw her a year later with 22 lesions. She left my practice and came back a year later. She had nine remaining teeth. And she, you know, she apologized for not believing me and not trusting me when I presented that to her. And I, and I, in fairness, I, I probably wasn't very good at presenting it to her at the time. Moderate risk patients. Again, it's an always carries risk assessment with a carry screen in my practice at least once a year. Now the patient has a risk factor. So I'm gonna recommend a fluoride varnish. I'm gonna see this patient twice a year. I'm gonna recommend those products. Um, and then I'm gonna personalize and talk to them about their risk factors. So I wanna target the risk factor so they understand like you don't have any cavities right now, but you've got a risk factor that if this continues and you don't address it, you may end up with cavities the next time I see you. So I want them to be educated on that. Then the high risk patient, these are people that have cavities, right? Um, Carries risk assessment, I'm gonna see these patients four times a year. They're gonna get every three months of fluoride varnish, always. I'm gonna talk to them about a 5,000 fluoride denifrous, always. Uh, I may or may not use an antimicrobial strategy if they don't have a biofilm issue that I've identified particularly, a high biofilm load. Um, I, I may or may not use the antimicrobial agent. Um, I may or may not use silver diamine fluoride depending upon where the lesions are at in their mouth and whether or not they'll tolerate having black stained areas. Uh, but again, I'd like to use those two if I can. And then if this is going to be you know, full-blown coaching targeted to all their risk factors, having them decide what they want to focus on, how they want to solve it, and which one risk factor they pick the risk factor and they're going to work on just one at a time. And so that's how you can be most effective as a coach. So Danny, I, I think it is um, 
I think we <laughs> we are at 74 minutes. Um, and pretty I pretty thank, spot on, buddy. I want to thank what everybody you, who attended tonight or is listening to this as a recording. Um, my email address is on the screen. If you're listening, it's Kim Cooch at AOL.com. That's K I M K U T S C H at AOL.com. Uh, please e email me if you um, if I can be a resource to you. If you are stuck on a patient or you you don't know where to go next or what to do next, um, email me. And I always answer my emails, so please uh, contact me that way. All right. Well, with that, first of all, let me thank you for a uh, fantastic presentation, Kim. Uh, I, I know we were you had a lot of material to go through, and I. I you can see it's in your first rodeo because you paced yourself, and I particularly appreciate, and I know our attendees do as well, uh, how you wove in both the clinical and the behavioral aspects and how your protocol uh, is not one size fits all. As you, you know, summarized at the end there, you have a different protocol depending on the uh, where the patient is at and, yep. and, and the, 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 the skills that you use to engage the patient. So instead of talking at them, you you empower them. You become part of their team. And you know, I would ask our our, our attendees to consider the the physical plant. You know, do you have the means to actually sit side by side with a patient? Because I know a lot of my health partners' offices are not set up for that. Yeah, and, and it's really that's it's an really, important switch. It's an important and it's important not to do this in the dental operatory. Mm -hmm. It's important to be knee to knee, eye to eye, or side by side when you're coaching like that. And one of the comments that I like to make to patients is, I know you can do this. Like, I see you being successful at that. I am so excited. I know you can do this. You know, because cheering that person on and maybe giving them some confidence that they don't see in themselves is an important part of this as well. But yeah, being able to, to have the physical environment to be able to sit side by side, I think is really, really important, right. Danny. That's a great point. Uh, and not not merely being non-judgmental, but being an advocate, being enthusiastic. Because as our as our friend Bill Blatchford, I think references Henry Ford. Nobody ever bought anything without an exchange of enthusiasm. <laughs> yes. I want to remember that. <laughs> now, before we jump on to questions and answers, uh, I believe you've got a special offer you want to share with our attendees. So please take a few moments to to share. Yep, yep, Danny. Thank you for that. Yeah. So. Um, I've written a book in the last, uh, it's been out uh, over a year now. It's titled Why Me? It's the second book on dental caries that I've written. And this one is really a self-discovery um, book for your patients, for them to figure out on their own what's driving their disease. And I, I hand these out to my patients and say, I want this is your copy. Take it home, read it, uh, yellow, highlight it, earmark it, do whatever you need to do. But if you see something in there that, resonates with you and you think this is me, I need to know that. Bring it back and let's sit down and talk about it. Uh, so it's won three nonfiction awards. I'm really happy with the book. I'd love to send you a free copy. Uh, either take a photo of the QR code there on the screen or go to carryfree, C-A-R-I-F-R-E-E dot com slash why me and, and we'll send you uh, a free copy. And if you want more information about Carry Free products um, that Doug Young and I developed, uh, you can text the number on the screen and, and get a free webinar or however we can help and support you to be to be more effective and uh, for your patients in treating dental caries. All right. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Um, just uh, for those of you who aren't watching, I think the uh, the actual website address is um, carryfree.com slash y hyphen me. Is that right? All right. Okay. Yes. Yep. Correct. Very good. But once okay. they get onto the carry free website, they'll be able to find it. Great. Okay. Terrific. Um, well, um, let's jump into questions. We got quite a few, and I still want to leave time for concluding remarks and for everyone to get their uh, extended weekend Memorial Day weekend yeah. started. Uh, and some of these questions were asked uh, early on, and I think you may have addressed some of them, but I think they 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 bear a bit of. Uh, of, of review in any case. The first question is, what do we need to start doing caries risk management? Yeah, so that's a great question, Danny. You have to have a caries risk assessment form. Like that's number one. And so um, I don't care what form you use. Uh, I, I personally think the form I developed is the, is the simplest and 
will be the easiest for you to be successful in your practice using, but the ADA has a form, the California Dental Association has John Featherstone's form, uh, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry has a form. So there have been a number of forms. My form actually took data uh, from John, with his permission from John Featherstone, and I simplified his form with his permission for clinical practice. Uh, so you need to have a carries risk assessment form kind of to start with. Uh, and then, Danny, the next step in my mind as I'm sitting here thinking about this is then like, how do you, then where do you start? Uh, I, and I would tell you, you could start with, you know who your high-risk patients are. I mean, you know who those problem patients are. Uh, you could start with just them and do risk assessment for just them. I mean, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is hand out that risk assessment form for every patient um, in your practice and start there. Another one is just do it for new patients only, you know, until you get your feet wet, uh, until you integrate that into your practice. So you can start kind of in any, I mean, everybody is going to do it differently, but you could start with uh, any one of those patients and then, you know, start with that. And I would probably do, um, I, I would probably do some role playing with your team. Bingo. I was going to, you'd mentioned it earlier and I was going to confirm that we, I think that's the best. Why not do risk assessments on one, on each other exactly. and then practice being the patient, being the clinician and, yep. uh, and then practice get your feet wet that way. And practice the coaching language, you know, using the term that's, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. If you do that a few times, it's when you then are actually with a patient, uh, in fact, I teach a coaching workshop and I have everybody practice that, you know, uh, because if you just do that a few times, the next time you sit down with a patient and you say that, it's going to feel comfortable for you. You're going to go, yeah, yep. oh, that's, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Uh, and when so their eyes light up and they, they perk up because everybody likes to, to feel like they're interesting, yeah. uh, it, it lets them know that, that they're being heard and they're yep. being understood and appreciated. It's, it's yep. extremely powerful. Yep. Simple, brilliant in its simplicity, I might say. Uh, next question, can dental insurance be billed for risk assessments? Uh, we billed Dentical, but did not know DDCA will also pay for it. Yeah, there is a, C I, you can bill. There are CDA codes for uh, that D601, 602, 603. Um, so you can bill, I, you may not have coverage from every policy in your area, and that's specific to your area. So I couldn't tell you whether or not you're gonna get paid for it, but uh, certainly there, the CDT codes exist, and I would definitely recommend uh, billing for it. And an average fee, well, can we do that? I can we talk about average fee? Average, okay. fee? Uh, sure. yeah, average fee is somewhere around $50, and I, that's the information I get from insurance companies. Very good. Um, uh, how do how do I make the decision to remineralize or restore a lesion? You know, Danny, that's that's the million dollar question at the moment. <laughs> uh, and so there are several factors, and this is really important uh, for everybody that's listening. This is like really important for you in your practice. Um, if it's an E1 or E2 lesion, that means it's limited to the enamel. E, I would recommend that you try remineralizing. Now, when you get down to evidence-based dentistry, that's a three-legged stool, one of which is our best scientific data. Uh, number two is your skill and judgment and experience as a clinician. And, but number three is what the patient wants, right? The patient is number three. Um, and so you may have a patient that just says, nah, I'm not interested in that, or I'm not gonna do that. And I, and I have people like that. Well. You're, you're wasting your time to send them home with a 5,000 gel and, and tell them, you know, to be able to remineralize, it's going to take them using that twice a day and or maybe a fluoride rinse or, and flossing and, you know, whatever. Um, you're going to have patients that will be really interested in doing that and it'll work. And then you got the patients that are not going to be interested. When you get into that D1, where I have the challenge is if you've got a D2 lesion, that's middle of the dentin radiographically, I'm going to recommend you probably restore that too. At D1, that's the real question mark. And short of having a, uh, using a, an ortho separator and physically being able to actually examine the surface by looking directly at it, we don't have any technology that will predictably tell us 
uh, with high sensitivity and specificity whether or not that lesion is cavitated. So what I would recommend that you do if you make a decision to, to uh, treat, restore a D1 lesion, write it down. I decided to, here's the reason I restored it. They had other lesions in the mouth some, you know, that were obviously cavitated. They're high caries risk. The patient had no interest in remineralization. Whatever your logic and, and your, your skill and judgment is, just document it. Because there have been a couple of lawsuits for overtreatment and they didn't document anything. They just, you know, in fact, didn't do a caries risk assessment. Um, and we're, we're basically you know, sued for, for overtreatment. So I just want you to be aware of that's going on. The ADA recommends that we're not treating things until they're kind of in that interface of the D1, D2, that stage. So um, just document. But I would use their caries risk assessment. Um, their, you know, and my experience with that particular patient, and you know what other lesions might look like in their mouth, and then document it. That's a great question, Dan. Yep. I'd like everybody yep. to be aware of that. Yep. Great answer. Thank you. Yeah. When should I recommend an antimicrobial rinse? Does the treatment rinse increase systolic blood pressure like chlorhexidine does? Yeah, actually, it does not. So that um, I have data on that. I collected treating patients. In fact, we looked at you know levels of bacteroides and Bionella. In fact, it increased levels of those two bacteria, which are the pathway for that nitrate nitrite nitric oxide pathway which you know reduces the sy systemic blood pressure so uh, while chlorhexidine interrupts that um, based on the research interrupts that pathway based on my data uh, the treatment rinse with sodium hypochlorite does not when do you use it <clears throat> when you have a patient that if they have a plaque buildup um, or if you're using a biometric and they have a high bio biofilm load in the mouth they're going to benefit from a antimicrobial agent and but it's probably one of the things we know about treating these biofilms particularly for that high caries risk person uh, it may take a year to two years to treat that biofilm successfully this is not a 30-day one and done kind of thing uh, so it's and which i thought it was going to be when i started doing this you know 25 years ago but it literally it's something that takes a long time when we did that clinical trial in australia those can those kids continued to improve uh, for two years uh, now the third year there was no additional improvement but up to two years to to change the biofilm so it takes some time yeah. um, and, and, and you mentioned probably, that uh, yeah. go ahead no no that's probably the best you know best answer i can give you on that yeah, and you mentioned biofilm is one of the one of the suspects in your pattern identification mm -hmm. pro, uh, uh, paradigm. Um, so it doesn't sound like biofilm is is always present or a, a factor in, uh, in no. caries. So Danny, um, Danny, take a, take. Let's yeah. go back for a second to the patient that had a dry mouth that I showed you. Mm -hmm. yep. She didn't have a biofilm issue, mm -hmm. right? So right, it, it's not going to sure. help her at all. Her problem is the fact she doesn't have any saliva. Right, so mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is a person whose plaque control was uh, she had a hundred, she had a zero plaque index, right? So it's like that's not an antimicrobial agent is not going to help her. That's not her problem. Her problem is she doesn't have a saliva, right? So we need to address that to help her stay hydrated, etc. Yeah. Sure. Well, my statement was by way of a lead into a question. Here's what, here was yeah. which, which was or is. Do you have any opinion about uh, closest risk as part of your? Uh, a part of an oral regimen for those patients with biofilm issues. As I'm sorry, as as what closes? Closes, C L O S Y S. It's uh, oh, yeah. by Ropar Pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I and believe. that has and that has um, chlorine dioxide in it. I think. Um, you know, that's a good antimicrobial agent. Um, sodium hypochlorite is better. I mean, it's stronger. Uh, sodium hypochlorite is the second strongest oxidizing agent we've got on the planet behind ozone. So the studies that have been done, you know, in periodontal treatment, most of these come out of uh, Jorgen Slots from USC, but they're pretty impressive at, at the results with it in terms of treating biofilms. So, I mean, you can use Closis, um, but in my mind, if you're gonna use an antimicrobial rinse, I'd go with the big gun. Okay, excellent. Yeah. All right, we've got time for one last question, which is how do I know if the Nano HA product I'm recommending has needle-shaped particles or not. 
Um, ask the ask the 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 company. Um, I would tell you that um, you know this is just one way, but if it's a product that has a high level of nano HA and it's and it's an inexpensive product, um, it's probably the supplier is probably coming from China, and it's probably 200 nanometers more average size and may well be needle shaped. So, but just ask the company. You know, by the way, I, you have a nano HA product. What's the particle size and what's the shape? And if Excellent. they don't know, and if they don't know the answer to that question, um, you might look at a different product. All right, very good. All right, in a few days, you will all receive an email detailing how to apply to receive your one and one half hours of CE. Uh, owing to the fact there's a holiday coming up, it may be early next week before you receive your follow-up email. So I uh, appreciate and ask your patience on receiving of that. And a number of people asked me to repeat the course code. I'm happy to do that. Uh, the course code is KUT052523. I now invite you to mark your calendars for Thursday, June 22nd, when my very special guest will be Charles Whitney, MD, whose, presenta whose presentation is titled, Your Passport to Collaboration. Alzheimer's disease is on the rise in the US. Until now, it has been thought to be a terminal disease with no cure. Since 2017, physicians have been using a method called RECODE, which is short for Reverse Cognitive Decline, developed by UCLA neurologist Dr. Dale Bredesen. An August 2022 peer-reviewed study in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease showed that 84% of patients improved using this method. The best drug reduces decline by only 20%. Oral conditions are a major contributor to cognitive decline. Medical professionals and patients are being taught that periodontal bacteria, airway obstruction, and mercury from amalgams are all root causes of Alzheimer's, and to seek the expertise of certified dental professionals for both reversal and prevention. Simply put, dentists and their teams are imperative for optimal success. Charles Whitney, MD, was selected to be on the teaching faculty of Dr. Bredesen's RECODE certification course for medical and dental professionals. He will be sharing the details about this program and how certification in dementia care can benefit patients, the practice, and you personally. It all happens on Thursday, June 22nd, so be sure to save the date and watch your inbox to register. Until then, this is Danny Bobro, thanking you for your commitment to practice perfection and thanking you once again, Kim, for a terrific presentation. Hey, thank you, Danny, and thanks for having me on, and I uh, hope everybody has a safe and enjoyable weekend. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody.